I am Phil Ashey from the American Anglican Council, and I'm also here in my capacity as chair of the Governance Task Force of the Anglican Church in North America. It's that time of the year again when we prepare for Provincial Council in June, and we look at uh, changes to our ever-changing uh, Constitution and canons. So what I'm going to do uh, in this first go-around uh, is to share with you 14 different changes uh, that were proposed, and uh, most of which were um, uh, forwarded on to you for your comment. And um, what we're going to do is also give you the timeline for how we're going to go about receiving your input and your feedback because of that great uh, principle from uh, conciliar governance, that which touches all must be decided by all. And so we're inviting you to send your comments in uh, to me, and I will send it out to the governance task force, and then we'll come back to you in late April for uh, another one of these videos before we uh, go to Provincial Council in June uh, to make sure that uh, we're thinking through everything carefully and in a godly and good way. So let's begin, and let me just say a quick prayer. Father, we thank you that you've given your church to be that uh, wonderful and holy mystery. We pray that you would enable us to strengthen that which is good and correct that which is not, and may it all be to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, our first change to our uh, canons is under Title I, the definition of certain terms. You can follow along if you want, but we'll also have text on the screen for you to look at. And in the beginning of our canons uh, is a, a definition of certain terms. And we've added one in here, uh, the term ecclesiastical authority. And that term runs throughout our canons, and we notice that it was not defined in any one place, so we're defining it now. What ecclesiastical authority means is the bishop having jurisdiction of a diocese uh, when he is there, and when he is not there, either because he's retired or he's died or he's incapacitated or he's been removed from office, then the ecclesiastical authority that has authority to act for the diocese becomes what we call the standing committee or its equivalent. So that's the very first change we have. The second change we have is to Title I, Canon 6, Section 9. You remember last year we had a lengthy revision of this canon uh, because it's about uh, congregational transfers. And we added to the title, only to the title, Canon one, uh, this is Title I, Canon 6, Section 9, Concerning Transfer or Disaffiliation, because it says in Sub 5 of Section 9, congregations reserve the right to disaffiliate with the church after consultation with their bishop. So therefore, it's not just about transfer, it's also about disaffiliation. Now the third change that was uh, proposed to us had to do with duties of the laity. Uh, with the help of God's grace, it shall be the duty of every member of the church. And someone suggested that we should change that to all members of the church. And we just couldn't see a compelling reason to change the language. So we're leaving it as it is. And then uh, under Title I, Canon 10 of the duties of the laity, we were going to add in uh, the standards regarding holy matrimony in Title II, Canon 7. But we realized that really the, the ethical standards that we're talking about in uh, subsection 10 of Title I, Canon 10 on the duties of the laity to affirm and follow the biblical standards of sexual morality and ethics, that already includes our teaching on holy matrimony. So we have tabled that change as well. Everything remains the same. Our fourth change in our canons has to do with missionary districts. And this is under Title I, Canon 12, Missionary Districts. Now, a missionary district is a, uh, an area or a group um, that is uh, focused on for the purpose 
of reaching them with the mission of uh, Christ's transforming love, changing their lives. Uh, that's less than a diocese. Uh, it may be on the way to a diocese. But a missionary district uh, comes into formation in two ways, either by initiative of one or more dioceses or directly by initiative of provincial council, that is, of the province. And so in those cases, we had to ask the question, well, if a, uh, a missionary district comes into being, either of these ways, uh, where are the clergy going to be domiciled? Where are they going to have their residence? And who's going to pay for this missionary district? So under uh, Canon 12 of missionary districts, paragraph or section 4, where the initiative is of one or more dioceses, Episcopal oversight and financial support of the missionary district shall be the responsibility of the district and such diocese that launched it, not of the province. And then secondly, clergy and congregation shall all be domiciled together in one of the dioceses which is forming this missionary district. Now, on the other hand, where the initiative is of the provincial council, the College of Bishops may elect a bishop for special mission who will be domiciled in an existing diocese of the province. See, he's got to be domiciled somewhere, but since it's not the initiative of the diocese, he'll pick a diocese that, uh, that he's already a part of or feels an affinity for. Financial support of the missionary district shall be the responsibility of the district and of the province, not of the bishop for special missions Diocese of Domicile. So he's just there because you have to be domiciled uh, in some diocese somewhere. And then we go on to say that the, bishop, the clergy and congregations will be domiciled in the diocese in which the bishop for special mission is domiciled. And the bishop for special mission shall owe canonical obedience to the archbishop and college of bishops and the clergy of the missionary district shall owe canonical obedience to the bishop for special mission. Now you see, this is for a mission district, a missionary district that's launched by the province. If it's launched by several dioceses, well, or one or more dioceses, they can always elect a suffragan bishop or an assisting bishop or the diocese and may himself be the, the bishop for special mission. Now, on the, uh, the next change, which is in Title II of the Canons, and we invite you to turn there in your handout, on Christian marriage. We made a specific reference, you'll remember last year, around this great debate over whether holy matrimony is a sacrament uh, or not. And we came up with the language uh, that holy matrimony commonly called a sacrament, according to Article 25, and ACNA Catechism, paragraphs 124 and 125, is a lifelong covenant between one man and one woman. So we were clear to say last year that it's um, commonly called a sacrament, according to the Articles of Religion, but it's not one of the two dominical sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion, that we commonly acknowledge as being of the Lord. Well, someone said, you know, the catechism is going to be changing, no doubt, as it's revived, so shouldn't we strike specific references to the paragraphs? And after a, a, a short discussion, we said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to leave those references in. We've got a new catechism. It's wonderful, but uh, those paragraph references are absolutely correct for the proposition that we stand for in this canon. So we're making no changes to canon, uh, Title II, Canon 7 on Christian marriage. The next canonical change is in Title III. And if you want to turn there to Canon 6 of the acceptance and dismissal of clergy in this church. And under Section 3 of Canon 6 concerning voluntary resignation from the ordained ministry of this church. Well, you know, it's possible that after a while you might decide, I just, I just don't want to carry on in the Anglican Church in North America. I want to go to a different denomination. And if you're a clergy person, 
then uh, you can submit uh, a resignation from holy orders and that will be received and evaluated. You, we have to make sure that you're not under uh, ecclesiastical discipline, either facing a charge or an accusation, because this is not um, an easy out to avoid ecclesiastical discipline. But if, if you're in good standing and there's no reason affecting your moral character, uh, you just want to go to a different denomination, then this canon provides for you to be able to do that with a blessing and maybe even a commendatory letter to your new um, ecclesiastical home from your ACNA bishop. But the question arose from one of our dioceses that had uh, a couple of clergy who did this, and then they said, gosh, I think that was a mistake. I'd like to come back in. Uh, what do we do? Well, we didn't have a canon. We hadn't imagined that would take place. So we added two new sections to this canon uh, to describe what happens. And that is, a, uh, under subsection 4, a deacon or presbyter having voluntarily resigned from the ordained ministry of this church and not under the discipline of any ecclesial body. Now see, we're not trying to make this an escape so that, you know, gosh, you tried to escape from ACNA uh, facing accusations, you then went to the Methodist church and now you're wanting to come back in because you've got ecclesiastical discipline facing you there. Now, that, that's not what this is about. This is if you are in good standing, uh, if there's no reason affecting your moral character uh, uh, for this decision. You're just saying, gosh, I think I made a mistake. I'd like to come back into the Anglican Church in North America. Well, this is what we say. We say that you may petition the bishop having jurisdiction in the diocese from which you, as a deacon or presbyter, resigned to restore the right to exercise in this church, that is the Anglican Church in North America, the gifts and spiritual authority as a minister of God's word and sacraments, uh, conferred in ordination. But now here's the important point. The terms and conditions of such restoration shall be entirely within the discretion of the bishop having jurisdiction in the diocese from which the deacon or presbyter resigned with the advice and consent of the standing committee or its equivalent. See, what are we saying? We're saying, well, you can't just do this with another diocese. The diocese you left will know best why you left and will want to ask you certain questions and be sure that this is not a ping pong situation, that you're genuinely coming in for good reasons and they may ask you to fulfill certain requirements and it's entirely within their discretion uh, uh, in the person of the bishop and then in this wonderful conciliar way uh, with the consent and advice of the standing committee. Now, what happens if the diocese that you resigned from um, went out of business? What happens then? Now you don't have a diocese to go back to. Well, we provide in subsection 5, if the diocese from which the deacon or presbyter resigned no longer exists, petition shall be submitted to the archbishop or to a diocesan bishop designated by the archbishop. Now, our next canonical change is, again, under Title III, and this is of bishops, uh, and specifically under Section 4 of Canon 8 of bishops concerning the election of bishops. This is very important because we have a number of bishops who are going to be retiring uh, in the next five to ten years, and so we want to make sure that we get this right. And under uh, Title I, uh, Canon 5, Section 7, the Executive Committee of the Province, of the Provincial Council, uh, every year must do a sustainability review of the diocese to make sure uh, that it's doing well. But in a case where a diocese is going to elect a bishop, we want to make sure that this diocese is growing, that it has the funds to support a full-time bishop and the staff that's necessary to carry on Episcopal ministry. And that needs to take place before the College of Bishops gives consent uh, to an election. And they have to see this report from the Executive Committee. So we added under Section 4, sub paragraph 1, with the consent of the College of Bishops, a diocese may commence the process of election of a bishop 
This consent to commence the process may be by electronic or telephonic meeting of the College of Bishops. And then we added this. The College of Bishops shall consider the report of the Executive Committee on the sustainability of the electing diocese, citing Canon Title I, Canon V, Section 7, prior to its decision whether to grant consent to the diocese to commence the process of the election of a bishop. And this came out of the discussion amongst the bishops themselves in Melbourne, Florida, and then out of the executive committee uh, to which we brought uh, these concerns. So there's now developing a wonderful timeline. Um, recognize the need to, uh, to begin to plan for the election of a bishop. Do your sustainability review with the executive committee to see if your diocese is uh, in shape and ready for the election of a new bishop and then it goes, uh, the report, if it's favorable, goes to the, the bishops. Uh, actually, even if it's unfavorable, it goes to the bishops and they make a decision whether or not to give consent. Now the next canonical change is again under Title III, Canon Eight of Bishops, concerning bishops for special mission. And um, as you know, we talked earlier about why we need bishops for special mission appointed by the province to look over a missionary district. But under the existing canon, uh, we have the same language that we struck last year uh, in general when we're talking about election of bishops. And that language was the College of Bishops may certify two or three candidates from whom one may be elected by the affirmative vote of two-thirds of the college. Well, that was the kind of language we inherited at our birth, where the idea was that a diocese could elect to, uh, or send up to the College of Bishops two or three candidates. And we've come to realize, of course, that um, the diocese itself knows much better than the College of Bishops um, who should stand for election and uh, who should be the bishop. Um, and likewise, if the province is going to appoint a missionary bishop, they will know the college who appoints this bishop or special mission without having to choose two or three candidates who that person should be. So we just struck that language so that uh, there's no confusion. It's the, uh, the college that decides and it's any male presbyter of this church qualified by these canons may be elected as a bishop for special mission by the College of Bishops. Now, our next canonical change is in Title IV. All the rest of these are going to have to do with ecclesiastical discipline. And you will remember from the floor of Provincial Council and Provincial Assembly that um, at least one chancellor raised the issue of how important it is in the interests of due process and fairness that we spell out what rights an accused clergy person has, deacon or presbyter, when they're facing an accusation and a trial um, on those accusations. And so we added to clarify in uh, Title IV, Canon Three, Section Three, concerning canonical investigation, presentment, and trial, um, uh, two, two things. Number one, we said that if the bishop deems the accusers not to be credible and the accusations to be without any merit, he shall inform the accusers of his determination and the accusers shall have the right within 30 days of such determination by the bishop. And that's a change from the right from 30 days uh, after. Um, and we wanted just to make it absolutely clear by the use of this language that there is a specific time period within which accusers can appeal um, a decision of a bishop to the standing committee. Now, the next canonical change that we have is also under uh, Canon 3 of Presentments of Presbyters and Deacons. And this is under Section 3 again, only this time we're looking at Paragraph or Section 6. Um, if it is determined by the ecclesiastical authority that a trial should occur, then a presentment shall be prepared and procedures followed according to the norms of ecclesiastical law. 
such procedures shall acknowledge the presumption of innocence of the accused and the right to representation by counsel. And then again, from the floor, this concern that we spell out the rights of the accused, the right to confront and examine witnesses and shall be consistent with principles of fairness, due process, and natural justice. Okay? And um, the very next canonical change, which is under Canon 5 of courts, membership, and procedures, uh, actually incorporates exactly the same language under uh, Canon 5, Section 7, where it says, Again, such procedure shall acknowledge the presumption of innocence of the accused and the right to representation by counsel, the right to confront and examine witnesses, and shall be consistent with principles of fairness, due process, and natural justice. So our next canonical change is again under Title IV, Ecclesiastical Discipline. This is Canon IV of Presentments of Bishops. So. Here's how it normally happens with a, a presbyter or a deacon. So you have an accusation, uh, you have a meeting with the bishop, you have an investigation, um, you decide whether or not there's going to be uh, charges filed. Uh, the presbyter or deacon can either go to trial or uh, voluntarily submit to the discipline of the church, and then there's sentencing. It's a different process for a bishop under uh, this canon four. What happens is you, you have accusations and an investigation that follows, uh, and uh, that would include interviewing the bishop and interviewing the accusers and all that. And then uh, those, uh, that, that evidence goes to um, either the archbishop or three senior bishops who will decide whether to file a presentment, and that's um, the ecclesiastical disciplinary term for an indictment, if you will, okay? Uh, it's the charging document. And the, the step that we have uh, for bishops that we don't have anywhere else is there's a board of inquiry. It's almost like a grand jury. It looks at that indictment, that presentment, and it looks to see is there reasonable cause or probable cause uh, to proceed on these charges according to the presentment. That's all that it does. It doesn't try the case. It just says, is there reasonable or probable cause? And um, according to the existing canons, you go from accusation, investigation, uh, presentment, board of inquiry, declaration of the board of inquiry, which I'll mention just a minute, and then trial. There's no opportunity actually, as there is for a deacon or a presbyter, to submit to the voluntary discipline of the church if you're a bishop. We felt that was uh, unnecessary, and, uh, and yet uh, we want to maintain the high standards that we have uh, so that we can give uh, the Board of Inquiry its opportunity to declare what charges publicly are being filed against the bishop, uh, what may go to trial, and what charges the bishop may decide to uh, plead guilty to, if you will, confess to fully, uh, and acknowledge and submit to the voluntary discipline of the church. So all of that's the background for the change we've made in Title IV, Canon IV, under Section 6, concerning the findings of the Board of Inquiry. If in the judgment of two-thirds of the Board of Inquiry there is probable cause to present the accused bishop for trial for violation of Canon 2 of this title, that's the canon that describes the offenses, it shall make a public declaration of the charges, if any, that shall proceed to trial. So you see, it's clarifying. The Board of Inquiry may say, well, um, you know, he's, uh, we find probable cause on counts one through four, not on counts five through seven, and we recommend dismissal of those. Well, then we provide in new section seven concerning voluntary submission to discipline, this opportunity for the bishop. At any time after the Board of Inquiry makes its public declaration, the accused bishop may confess to the truth 
of any or all of the charges declared by the Board of Inquiry and submit to the discipline of the church. That's the same language we use for voluntary discipline of presbyters and deacons. And then we add, if the bishop disputes any of the charges, those charges shall proceed to trial. So he could say, I'll, um, I'll submit, I'll uh, fully confess to, to um, charges one through three, but I dispute four and five, so he'll receive discipline on charges one through three in any event, and four and five will go to trial. So we've just smoothed out and clarified this process. Now with regards under uh, Title IV to sentencing, it became important for us to recognize um, who does the sentencing and on what grounds. Is it um, upon voluntary submission? Is it after trial and a guilty verdict? Uh, we didn't want that to be a side point. And so under uh, Title IV canon of sentences concerning sentencing of a presbyter or deacons, we remove the parentheses around whether by trial or voluntary submission to the discipline of the church, so that it's clear that this is what happens regardless of how the guilt is found. And then uh, in section two, concerning the sentencing of a bishop, again, trying to make this very clear, the College of Bishops, speaking through the archbishop or his designate, has the sole responsibility and authority to pronounce sentence of a bishop. So if you're a bishop, you'll be sentenced uh, by your peers. Uh, and uh, on a bishop convicted, whether by trial or voluntary submission to the discipline of the church as indicated in these canons. So again, whether it's by voluntary submission to the discipline of the church or by trial, this is how a bishop will be sentenced. Our last, final, uh, canonical change is to the provincial list. You'll remember this is what we created last year um, so that we have a readily accessible list of uh, all those clergy who've been convicted, um, who've received a sentence uh, for a violation by voluntary submission or by trial to one of the offenses listed in Title IV Canon II. And that provides a ready way, as we explained last year, for um, search committees and bishops and others involved in the process to make sure that the person who's applying, that they're uh, screening, um, that they know immediately whether uh, they was ever a, an ecclesiastical disciplinary matter that they faced. Well, it became clear that if we're going to maintain this list in a, in a confidential way, uh, that we have to have provincial staff members who are authorized explicitly to do that. And so they asked us to um, make that, uh, that change in the canon. So it now reads the office of the archbishop, comma, including such members of the provincial staff designated in writing by the archbishop, comma, shall maintain a list of all those clergy who've been tried and convicted. Okay, so this gives express written authorization for a provincial staff to keep the list. And then down in subsection five, it said, the provincial list may only be accessed by bishops having jurisdiction, provincial chancellors, and diocesan chancellors. But it was brought to our attention that, you know, in every diocese, there's usually one person, it might be the canon to the ordinary or a canon for deployment or a deployment officer, <clears throat> for whom um, access to that list would be more important and more immediate than even the diocesan chancellor. So we amended that to read as follows. The provincial list may only be accessed by bishops having jurisdiction and up to two persons designated in writing by the bishop, comma, and the provincial chancellors. What does that mean? It means you can still include the chancellor but if you've got a deployment officer or a canon to the ordinary who's gonna be involved in that screening process, uh, they will have uh, access uh, to that encrypted uh, list and website. Now the question has arisen, um, should this list, since it's merely a list 
of uh, people who've been convicted of crimes? Should that be made public to everybody? And um, this is a question that we were not prepared to answer this go around. Um, there are obvious issues of defamation and liability that we don't want to put in front of the church at the same time. We have to have the highest standards of walking in the light uh, and in holiness of life. So we want to assure you that the Governance Task Force in consultation with the College of Bishops and the Executive Committee will be looking into this and will be coming up with a decision um, probably for our next Provincial Council in 2021. Now let me just say a little bit about your role in all of this. We welcome your comments. We welcome your questions. Um, you should know that every one of these canons uh, each, under each title has a subgroup of the Governance Task Force that's assigned to follow up with your, can with your comments and your questions. So if you would send your comments and your questions to me, and there's my email right there on the video screen in front of you, pashi at AmericanAnglican.org, I will send those right away to these teams and they will get back to you. And it's possible, as happened last year, that your questions and your concerns, uh, some of your suggestions, may well result in us amending these canons and these changes to reflect the changes that you have uh, asked us to do, or not. Um, but we take all of those things seriously, and again, again because uh, what touches uh, all should be decided by all, this is an open and transparent process to have you involved in the governance of the Anglican Church in North America. So this video is going to go out on Tuesday, March 3rd, this first draft report. From March 3 to April 10, you will have an opportunity to, uh, to send your comments in to my email address. And uh, April 10 is the deadline. And from April 10 to April 28, our sub-teams will be looking over your comments uh, our subgroups will respond to you. And then on Tuesday, April 29, um, we will send out the second draft report of the Governance Task Force by video just like this. So that's the timeline immediately. Uh, we encourage you to get those comments in by April 10, no later than April 10. And again, any comments, please send them to my email, which is on your screen, pashy at AmericanAnglican.org. God bless you, and we look forward to hearing from you.